Welcome to Theater Lens. That's the title of our lecture today. And welcome also to Dr. Roy Horowitz, who is today's speaker, and he is the Israel Institute visiting professor. Uh, he's also an acclaimed Israeli actor, director, translator, dramaturg, and scholar. And we're very happy uh, from the Center for Israel Studies to host him today. My name is Michael Brenner, the director of the center. And I also welcome him in the name of my colleague, our managing director, Laura Cutler. Uh, Dr. Roy Horowitz is a graduate of the Nissan Native Acting Studio. He received his BA and his MA from Tel Aviv University and his PhD from the Department of Comparative Literature at Bar Ilan University, where he is currently a senior faculty member. Dr. Horowitz has performed many roles for various theaters, both in Hebrew and in English. And he represented Israel in many prestigious festivals around the world, including the Edinburgh Festival and the Grahamstown Festival. He has been awarded Best Actor at the International Haifa Festival in 1997, and he also won Best Director Award for directing Pollard's Trial at the Kamari Theater, and um, also a film that in, uh, several films, including The Body with Antonio Banderas. Dr. Horowitz directed a succession of critically acclaimed productions. Um, and right now, his last, uh, uh, his last play, uh, My Zakopane, is running uh, at the Habima National Theater. And um, from what I heard, it is a fascinating uh, production, and we'll see, I think, a little bit of it today, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Dr. Horowitz was also the artistic director of the Municipal Theater in Kiryat Shmone. He was the dramaturg of the Beersheba Theater and a visiting professor at the University of Texas in Austin uh, and at Middlebury College. He's now Israel Institute visiting faculty here at American University. And his recent book, World of Innocence, The Dramatic Afterlife of the Bible in Yaakov Shabtai's Plays, was published uh, recently in 2021 in Hebrew and uh, hopefully will soon come out in English as well. And uh, these are all my uh, introductory remarks. Uh, we're all looking forward to our little journey through Israeli theater land and uh, I welcome uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Roy Horowitz. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, I, I don't see myself for some reason. Oh, now I see. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm very grateful and, and honored uh, to be here and for this uh, wonderful opportunity to share with you some of my views about the very live and kicking theatrical scene in Israel. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of the fact that Israel is really a theatrical empire. Um, in Tel Aviv alone, we have every evening some 50, 60 different shows, and Israel enjoys, I think it's the 12 year uh, in a row, the highest rate of theater goers in the world per capita. Uh, please bear in mind that what, with all due respect, what keeps the industry going in places like your Broadway in New York or the West End in London, are not the local people, but mainly the tourists uh, that allow Agatha Christie's uh, mousetrap to run forever and uh, Mamma Mia and uh, Le Miserable, et cetera. Whereas in Israel, it's the Israelis who are in love with theater and flock the venues. And each of these shows uh, that I mentioned before um, is being performed um, most of the time to, to full houses. So the scene is very um, live and kicking. And uh, being both a scholar and an actor director myself, I'll try to juggle between the different hats that I wear. And I brought with me some examples, some monologues, which I'd like to read to you in order to shed some light about what Israeli dramaturgy is all about, what are the central preoccupations of Israeli theater. And um, of course I was dependent on translations uh, to English, not everything that I wish to introduce you to um, uh, came out in an English uh, version, 
but uh, I managed to find uh, a lot of materials and uh, I already know that it's a mission impossible to do. Uh, I prepared so much material, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you'll, you'll have to stop me at a certain moment, Michael. Um, I'd like to, to start by, by some general information and just to uh, let you know that, uh, as I said, the scene is very uh, live and kicking, starting from the National Theater that you mentioned, Habima. And by the way, Israel, to the best of my knowledge, is the only country to have its National Theater established some 31 years before the actual state. Uh, Habima was founded in 1917 in Moscow, whereas the State of Israel came to life only in 1948. Uh, we are also very unique in this regard that uh, our national theater is not based in the capital city of Jerusalem, but in Tel Aviv. Uh, the holy city, uh, city of Jerusalem is not yet ready for uh, the e uh, moral institution of, uh, of or the, the concept of, of having a theater there. We are still waiting and maybe but our national theater is, is in Tel Aviv. Um, in general, I would say that, that um, theater um, um, is, is a new, is a relatively new phenomena into Jewish life, whereas the rest of the Western world have been practicing uh, theater and enjoying it ever since ancient Greece, some 2,500 years ago, uh, Jews started practicing and uh, getting to terms with the sheer concept of theater only 150 years ago uh, as part of what we call the enlightenment at the end of the 19th century. And we are very, uh, we are facing um, um, very modest beginnings with it. Um, unlike uh, the enormous contribution of Jewish uh, artists in the fields of music or of literature, in theater we are very fresh and, and, and young and, and, and beginners. Um, so this is something which is important to bear in mind. All the great masters of drama and theater are not Jewish. I think uh, wh whoever you can think of, starting from Moliere, Shakespeare, Ibsen, Lorca, Strindberg, uh, you name it, they are not Jewish. They are all either Pagans, you know, the Greeks and the Romans, or, or Christians. Uh, I think if I'm to pick up a, a Jewish, you know, great Dramatist, I think the first uh, name that might pop into my mind is, is probably Arthur Miller, but then we speak up at, uh, about the, 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 um, at the middle of the 20th century. So we are very uh, new to the business. And for many, many years, the Orthodox um, authorities, Jewish authorities, really rejected the sheer concept of theater and human representation on stage. And rightly so, they, they managed to recognize the immoral nature of, of theater, the fact that it is based on awful things. You know, I keep telling my students that uh, people who go to the theater regularly tend to see themselves, to view themselves as, as well-educated, whereas it proves the, um, quite the opposite, quite the contrary, because when we go to the theater, we enjoy uh, terrible stories. People are doing terrible things to one another, and we are sadistic, enjoying sitting in the dark and, and watching them suffer, betraying each other, doing terrible things. So um, Jewish authorities recognize this immoral nature, not to mention the fact that uh, the, the, the better you lie, the more appreciation and uh, recognition uh, uh, you get uh, in the theater. And they try to uh, keep uh, Jews uh, indistant from, from practicing this, um, um, uh, this phenomena. Uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, as I said, as part of the enlightenment, theater managed to um, put its foot into the door. And ever since then, the rest is history. And we became, as I said, uh, in love with theater and, and such a theatrical um, empire. Uh, so what I wish to do is really to expose you to, to the richness and diversity of the scene, which, as I said, starts with the national theater, but goes to municipal theater, fringe theaters, independent artists, uh, children and youth uh, groups, uh, with shows mostly in Hebrew, but also in English, in Arabic, in Yiddish, in Russian. I think it's just a matter of time till we start uh, having uh, shows in French with all the uh, big waves of uh, new uh, comers from, from France lately. Uh, so it's a very intense um, uh, scene. Uh, let me, you know, just um, um, jump into the water and, and share with you the first um, a clip that I brought. It's from a production which is currently running at the Camry Theater, which is the Municipal Theater of Tel Aviv. 
and it is based on a very successful novel by uh, Dorit Rabinian, who is a very uh, successful and, uh, and uh, um, uh, well-known um, uh, author in Israel. And the novel is called All the Rivers, Gader uh, Chaya in Hebrew, All the Rivers in English. And um, it, it takes place at the end of the second Intifada. Uh, and the reason I, I chose to start with it, it's because it has an American connection. It takes place in uh, snowy New York, actually. Um, two young Middle Easterns meet there, uh, Liat Binyamini, she is an Israeli translator who is in New York on a scholarship, and Hilmi Nasser, who is a, a, a Hebron, a born Palestinian painter who is living in Brooklyn. And the two of them uh, quickly develop a meaningful uh, relationship, but their love can only be when they are away from their homes and uh, its end is near and inevitable. Should you wish our own version to West Side Story, the Middle Eastern version of a uh, West Side Story. And I wish to share with you a scene which takes place here in New York, NYPD, uh, the heroine uh, is called uh, uh, for an investigation. So I should share my screen and I hope it will work. Just a minute. Yes, here it is. You were born in Israel? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And your parents? My parents are from Iran. Iran. They they immigrated from Tehran in the 60s. Sit down, please. So, both your parents are Iranian. Iranian Jews, yes. Mm -hmm. And you, yourself, have you visited Iran recently? Never. Are you sure? Maybe you visited relatives. <laughs> As you know, Iran is not a recommended place to visit for Israelis. Mm, but according to what I see here, you've had quite a few visits to Egypt in the past to several Egypt? years. Oh yes, to Sinai, to Sinai. We used to go there a lot when I was a kid, but we don't go there anymore. It became dangerous. Is this your laptop? Yes, but- May I? E excuse me. Ma'am. Ma'am, do you use your computer outside of this apartment in public places? I, I don't understand why he needs- were you at Aquarium Cafe on the corner of 9th and 6th Avenue the day before yesterday? Cafe Aquarium? Tuesday evening. Yes, yes, I was there. New York State Police received a complaint from a man who saw you at Aquarium Cafe. What man? A man who reported a Middle Eastern looking female involved in suspicious activity. This man claimed he saw you writing emails in Arabic. But I don't speak Arabic. So what is this? This is Hebrew, this is not Arabic. Hebrew? Uh, Hebrew. Lechaim? What? Shalom? Oh, oh. <clears throat> Can you read this? Read what? This email right here from Noam Darol. Yeah, who is uh, Noam to you? He's my boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend. Okay, read it to us, please. In Hebrew? Yes, please. But it's in Hebrew. Out loud, please. Can I read a different email, please? No. No, read this one. You were born in Israel? Oh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And your parents? My parents. Okay, <laughs> so this was the first uh, example. Uh, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that Israeli uh, theater deals a lot with what we call the conflict, you know, the, the current uh, affairs. Actually, I, I wish to, to say, if I'm to point out the two central preoccupations of Israeli drama, it will probably be the conflict, you know, the, the neighborhood we live in, uh, as in this example, and, and, and secondly will be uh, probably the, the Holocaust. Uh, um, there are over 100 Israeli original plays which can be categorized as Holocaust plays, and maybe we'll come to, to it uh, uh, later um, on. Um, so theater was actually part of, of the secular, nationalist, Zionist um, uh, revolution, and uh, doing theater by Jewish people for Jewish people was, was really part of this uh, cultural a renaissance in the last 150 years. Uh, later on, uh, on in, in the state of Israel itself, theater became one of the main locations for 
us to explore our identity and ask who actually are we as Hebrew speaking Jewish Israelis coming from more than 100 countries speaking some 70 different languages and from totally different cultures and, and traditions. And I think it, it won't be an exaggeration to, to claim that the theater in Israel uh, uh, is not just a reflection of, of the outside reality, but also takes a, a crucial part in actually shaping it and has plays a central uh, role in um, shaping the, the, the reality. Uh, another example which I wanted to um, um, share with you is from um, a play which was a major hit at the uh, at, at Habima Theater a couple of years ago, written by a young, relatively young um, playwright named Yael Ronen. And uh, this play uh, was called The Guide to the Good Life. And I wish to read to you a monologue of one of the characters. Her name is Ravit. She is a single uh, woman in her 30s, longing to be uh, to get married. And what I really like about this play is that it's a wonderful ability to inject humor into the uh, even to the heaviest uh, subject matters, and uh, to shed some light about what is it to be a youngster in Israel nowadays. Uh, the monologue is, uh, this is a phone um, call she makes to, I'm sure you have it here too, some kind of company which, which sells groupons or coupons, you know, discounts, vouchers, and she's calling them. It's, it's a company which is called Beauty Bargain, and uh, she calls there, and the uh, um, monologue goes like this. I'll, I'll read to you. It's a bit strange, you know, doing theater within this, but we all became baby Zoomers lately. So uh, here the, the monologue goes like this. She says, hello, beauty bargain. Yes, I'd like some information. The slimming soap that liquidizes body fat, is it painful? Okay, and the body fat that melts away, what, does it just wash off in the bathroom? Oh, great. So I'd like to order one of those, please. One more thing. The electronic breast muscles shaper, it doesn't actually electrify your boobs, does it? Oh, and how do you attach it to your breasts? Oh, vacuum, lifting and refirming. And does it enlarge them as well? Oh, that's what the natural capsules are for. Yes, could you put them, uh, could you put them on the list, please? Uh, they don't give you cancer, do they? Tested on what? Ferrets others. What's a ferret? A rodent, oh, ferrets, ferrets, they are called ferrets. Yeah, they are very smelly. What do I get with it? An electrical vibrating belt for shaping the abdomen muscles. For how much extra? Oh, undetectable under any item of clothing. Yeah, that's fab. Uh, one last thing, those wonder drops, Viva Young and Viva Lady, how can using them create perfect harmony with your partner and significantly improve your quality of life? Oh, the libido, wow. And the youthful energy, yeah, that's lovely, youthful. Yeah, that's really amazing. Yes, I'd like the ladies uh, and the men's too, just in case. Uh, hold on a second, uh, don't add it all up yet. The lifting cream for the forehead, how high does it lift? Oh, oh, what a brilliant idea. All right, put it on my list too and put it all up. Can I pay in installments? Okay, I'll pay in 18 installments. <laughs> that way I'll hardly notice it. Gosh, what a wonderful deal. A beauty bargain indeed. A Couple of days later, she, it's the middle of the night. She knocks hysterically on the front door of her friend and listen what she's got to say. The friend opens the door and Ravit stands there and says, hi, I don't know what I've done without you. I had no one to call. My mom would kill me if she knew I'd got arrested. You are an angel. Okay, okay, your feet, calm down. Tell me slowly what happened. How come you attacked a policeman? And why the hell were you detained as a dangerous terrorist? Because they thought I was a suicide bomber. What? Yes, I bought this electric vibrating belt for sleeping and shaping the abdomen. You can wear it under any piece of clothing and it's completely undetectable. Have it on at home, at work, whatever. I had a date in the grill bar. The guy was inside already. I was about to go in when the security man shouts at me, hold it, ma'am, stop right there. What's that under your shirt? 
and I said nothing, you know, because it's none of his business. You know, it's really none, none of his business. And then he pushes me to the floor and he starts yelling, a suicide bomber, a suicide bomber. He tried to rip my shirt off, pervert. So I beat him. And then he handcuffed me and started shouting at me at, in, in Arabic, wakif wala batucha, wakif wala batucha. And then the police came and left me away in case there were any more bombs around. Can I stay at yours tonight? So this is uh, <laughs> life in Israel nowadays. You can't even have this uh, uh, shaping uh, belt uh, underneath your shirt. Uh, which brings me to Hanoch Levin, maybe the most important influential uh, playwright uh, we had. Um, unfortunately, he died at the age of 56, but he left us with an enormous amount of plays, uh, some 70 plays. And I would like to read to you a monologue which concludes uh, uh, his play from um, 1997, a play named Murder, about you know the the constant um, uh, bloodshed between us and the Palest and the Palestinians, and at the end of the play uh, he writes this monologue. He, it's it's a prayer actually. Quiet, give us some quiet. One night of peace and quiet. Every night we say we've had it with murder. Tomorrow we'll have peace. Every morning a child is born and his parents say, by the time he turns 18, it has to end. And so 18 years go by and 18 more years and 18 more years. When you keep waiting for life to happen, you don't live. Lord, give us one month of boredom, good boredom, true boredom, Swiss-like boredom. How I wish I was bored. I wish I had depression out of boredom. I wish I could hang myself out of boredom. Give me a piece of that Swiss boredom because we cannot take, we are tired of the fascinating life in Asia. Yeah. That's uh, uh, Hanoch Levin. Uh, as I said, he wrote some 70 plays. He's really uh, the most important and produced um, Israeli playwright. And I wish to share with you a short clip uh, where some very famous figures whom you'll recognize speak about his enormous contribution and their view of Hanoch Levin's work. Here it is. המחשבות, הרגשות, האפלים, המוצנעים, המגוחכים, הקטנוניים אצל בני אדם, שאנשים מעזים לחלוק רק בינם לבין עצמם, ולפעמים גם את זה לא. חנוך לוין מאיר אליהם בפנס חד וחריף ונוקב, מלא הומור, מלא סאטיר, מלא סרקזם ומלא חמלה אנושית. מה לי ולבשר הזה המצפצף עכשיו, מתוך שינה שלווה, רואה בחלום נופים רחוקים שאני לא כלול בהם? מי עשה שבעודי ילד קטן נשרח ברחוב אחרי אבי כבר באיזה צומת בעתיד תחכה לי אישה זרה שאין לי כלום איתה ולה אין כלום איתי ואיזה דבק לא נראה אבל חזק משנינו ידביק אותנו זה לזה לנצח אני בת שש אני יכולה קצת מבחוץ אבל זה רק הטיח ותפסיקו ללדת כל כך הרבה ילדות חדשות הן גדלות ומקבלות שדיים הן לוקחות את השדיים שלי ואת האור שלי ומשתמשות בהם בלי לשלם לי. חיים את החיים והכל בסדר, ואז מתים באמצע המרק. באמצע המרק! באמצע המרק! באמצע המרק! קשה להסביר את עוצמת התגובה של הקהל. הם הרימו את תקרת הבטון של צוותו. חנוך לוין הפך למחזאי קלאסי. אתה לוקח מחזה שנכתב לפני 30 שנה, ואתה לא רק מגלה שהוא יכול להיות רלוונטי, הוא יותר רלוונטי היום ממה שהוא היה פעם. And he has this talent to reconciliate theater with the audience. He's very close to regular people.
העולם שלנו צוחק זה שעוד לא בוכה. Yeah, so th this is uh, uh, Hanukh Levin, and um, um, as, as, as I said before, um, the ability to inject humor into heavy subject matters is also characteristic, I think, uh, to his work and um, serves as a main artistic uh, merit. He wrote some um, 60 or 70 plays, which uh, actually exposes, you know, human nature, you know, um, a human being is, is portrayed as a cruel, selfish, uh, humiliating and, and humiliated, helpless and idiotic creature. You know, maybe just one um, example, which I, I, I don't want to uh, skip. Uh, it's, it, it's long be ago became um, Israeli classics, uh, a play by him named Krum, just the opening, um, 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 uh, act. Um, um, there is a, an old Jewish mother, Yiddish um, Mame, um, waiting at the airport for her son to come back from abroad. And she's very excited. And, and look at the relationship, the, the, the way he portrays, you know, uh, the intergenerational relationship within this family. She is waiting for him to come and she says, oh, the plane just landed. In another minute, I'll see my son. Oh, here he comes. In comes the son and he says, I didn't make it abroad, mother. I didn't make money and I didn't get happy. I didn't have fun, didn't get ahead, didn't get married, didn't get engaged and didn't meet anyone. I didn't buy anything, didn't bring anything. All I have in my suitcase is dirty underwear and toiletries. That's it, I've told you everything and I want you to leave me alone. I'm sure he's planning a surprise for me. No, definitely a little surprise for mother. No, no. What are you yelling for? Somebody wants something from you. You came back to fight. They are aggravating me already. A human being, that's his main claim. But he, he writes uh, about it in, in, in many um, uh, variations and, and, and very in, in, in various uh, uh, funny uh, ways. Uh, so this is uh, Hanoch Levin. I mentioned before that the Holocaust plays a central or is, is a central preoccupation of Israeli dramaturgy. And I'd like to share with you Uh, maybe the most successful Israeli play ever, written by Joshua Sobol, you must have heard of this play, named Ghetto, which is a good example, I think, for the way that Israeli theater deals with this, um, uh, with its national trauma of, of, of the Holocaust. Um, I, I would say that the conjugation of theater and Holocaust Uh, may raise some ethical, some very complex ethical and aesthetical questions, but it doesn't stop Israeli playwrights from keep coming back to this scene of crime. And Joshua Sobol uh, uh, brings in ghetto the incredible story of the theater company, which um, um, worked with inside the, the Vilner ghetto right until uh, the last uh, days. And uh, Um, really, this, this play has been produced all over the, the, the globe, um, I think over 70 productions to this day worldwide. And I want to show you the clip of the Chinese production, an Israeli play within a Chinese uh, production, which was made just before COVID, directed by Joshua Sobol himself. The really amazing story of this um, um, theater company within the midst of the horrors Uh, in the Vilner ghetto. So let's see this clip of ghetto in China, a short clip.
诉我怎么做。我知道是春天的鸟儿在歌唱，放我独自忧郁快乐。Wonderful production of of ghetto in in uh, China.、Uh, by the way, you could probably notice、uh, the character of Yaakov Gens, the head of the Judenrat, the Jewish Council in the ghetto, which is the leading character of the play. And actually, I I would say that um, uh, Joshua Sobol, uh, um, what he does in this play is he uses、um, the historical material in order to ask some very profound questions. I think about.、Uh, um, Um, later on, phenomena and 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 the actual um, um, the actual political reality in Israel uh, later on,、um, the, the the head of the Yudenrat、uh, is 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 trapped in an unbearable situation.、Uh, on one hand, the the victim see sees him as a collaborator with the Nazis, and the Nazis、uh, for them he is just、um, um, something very instrumental in order to. Uh, to to deliver their their commands to the to the Jewish community. At one point, I just like to read to you just a short monologue, which is really、uh, I think the peak of the of the whole play and manages to grasp I think the 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 complexity、uh, of the situation he was trapped in. At one sentence, Joshua Sobel writes for him this character, and of course it's 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 something which brings the the moral issues which are not. Just、uh, specific to 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 the Holocaust time,、uh, he says uh, he 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 confronts the,、um, the the his his Jewish brothers and he says to them, "I am trying to save Jewish blood, not Jewish honor. 
The Germans wanted 2,000 Jews. I gave them 406 old and sick people. Nothing can justify it. I know their blood is on my hands. I could have kept my hands clean, couldn't I? I could have told the Germans, do it yourself. And they would have taken as many as they wanted, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Go, run away, wash your hands clean, down to your fingertips. Go, celebrate your innocence. Go, save your saintly souls. If you survive, you'll say, we kept our conscience spotless clean, immaculate, while I, Jacob Gens, I'll come out smeared with filth, my hands dripping with blood. But I, I will submit myself to Jewish justice. I will stand trial and I'll say, all I did was done to save as many Jews as I could. To lead some to freedom, I had to lead others to death. I did it with my own hands. That was my choice. For you to preserve, to preserve your clean conscience, I had to plunge into the mire and deal with the pigs. A clean conscience for Jacob Gens, I couldn't afford it. Yeah. And I think this is really, um, you know, it, it, as, I, as I said, it manages to, to grasp uh, this dissonance of, of um, um, the Judenrat. Uh, let's come back to something uh, lighter. Uh, I wish to introduce you to Anat Gov, another very uh, important and uh, influential uh, playwright, a female uh, writer. Uh, I could have now developed, um, you know, um, 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 a session about what I call the intensification of the feminine voice in Israeli theater in recent years, uh, as part of the global trend of, you know, giving voice to um, uh, women and other, yes, Anat Gov, as, as Laura wrote at the, at the chat. Uh, and I wish to read to you the opening scene of uh, one of her um, uh, most successful, uh, really um, a big hit at the Gamery Theater, um, a comedy named Oh God, uh, where she writes um, about a, a woman psychologist who is uh, in her clinic and she is about to meet for the very first time with a new patient and in he comes and it turns out that he is no other than God himself coming, seeking for therapy. He is in terrible condition and he seeks uh, therapy. And this is a wonderful, very original comedy. I think I even heard it was done worldwide. And I think it even had here a production here at the Mosaic Theater a couple of years ago here. Michael says to me that I'm right. So uh, just the opening um, dialogue between the two, which is very funny and witty and original. And I think I've, I'm, I'm trying to bring you some examples which translate well into other places and show the universal appeal of, of Israeli um, uh, drama. So uh, she opens the door, she doesn't know who he is, and in he comes, uh, he walks around the room, he stops at a very big colorful painting hanging on the wall, and then he says, good, very good. Yeah, my son painted it. Oh, he's talented. He's autistic. Yes, I know. You know? Yes, I know. How, oh, what? Have you investigated me or something? I had a feeling that you are from the security services. No, no, I'm not from the security services. Or the Mossad. No, no. The Air Force? Getting warmer. So do I sit or lie down? What are the rules here? This is my first time and, well, uh, with me, people usually sit, but if you want. Uh... So who have you talked to about me? You know what, let's start from the very beginning. I'm Ella, and you? Me? Yes, what's your name? Oh, uh, I am who I am. Yes, that's obvious, but you must have a name. You can carry on calling me G. Look, if you are worried about publicity, I can assure you of complete confidentiality. I got some well-known patients and they all know that all their secrets remain in this room. Uh, okay, no problem. You know what, we'll come back to that later. Uh, do you wanna tell me how old you are? 5,768 next week. Oh yes, I sometimes feel that way too. So what do you do? What's your profession? You can write artist. Oh, is that why you didn't want to tell me your name? You are well known? Uh, pretty well known. Oh, interesting. Uh, yes, yes, interesting. So do you want to tell me what happened? What brought you to me? Uh, if it's difficult for you, we can begin with something else. Would you like to 
to start by telling me something about yourself or about your parents? My parents? Yes, your parents. You know, sometimes it's easier to start from the parents. For instance, what kind of father did you have? I didn't. Oh, he died? No, he never existed. Oh, so you were raised just by your mother? There is no mother either. No mother? Oh, from what age? From time immemorial. An orphan from birth? An orphan from birth. Oh my God, were you ever in therapy? No. Oh, you could have saved yourself so many years of suffering. Okay, never mind. Better late than never. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here because we are running out of time, but that's only the beginning. And oh, here people say, um, uh, Michael writes to me that it was great and he saw it at the Mosaic Theater. It's a very uh, witty and, and funny uh, comedy and she really um, did great with all her comedies. She has uh, a wonderful musical. She too died very, very young. I don't know what it is with, with Israeli playwrights. She died at the age of 59. And her last play, which is called Happy Ending, was based on her true experience and takes place in an oncological uh, department in a hospital. And it's a musical about cancer. Very funny one. Uh, you can't imagine, you know, the, here, once again, this incredible ability to inject humor and, and, and make a musical uh, with inside this uh, um, um, horrible um, 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 hospital. Uh, uh, since I see that I'm really running out of time, I, I wish maybe to um, end with this monologue by Nisi Maloney, another um, classical uh, Israeli writer. Actually, I can share the screen with you so you can see the text and, and read it out loud with me. Uh, and I wish to, um, uh, to link it to what I said at the beginning. I, I told you that we are very new uh, relatively speaking, to uh, to uh, theater. And therefore, you can find in many, many Israeli uh, plays that playwrights are still trying to promote the concept of theater, the actual concept, or to sell theater to their audience, to, to, to convince the, those who are not yet convinced that there is a room for theater and that theater is something which is uh, worth uh, coming and worth encouraging. And um, this uh, short monologue is for me, I think maybe the most beautiful love song uh, for the art and for the medium uh, itself that I know uh, in Hebrew here, it's translated into English and see how Nisi Maloney is selling theater to his audience. What has he got to say in defense of uh, theater? I'll share the screen and I'll read it to you. And then I think we'll open it to the discussion. Uh, so here it is. So the late Israeli playwright Nisi Maloney wrote, ladies and gentlemen, we the actors know that contemporary theater nowadays is how to say, not, that is not much. The lighting is no lighting, the dust is dust and the acting and the mishaps and the audience and the situation. Anyway, you cannot compare it with TV, no. But there is a cafeteria and intermission and you happen to talk to people. Yes, that is true. And still, and I insist still, only here at the theater, night after night, once the curtain falls, the dead come back to life, take the knife out of their heart, wipe out the blood, take off their death makeup. All this you'll find only here with us in the theater. And I think that uh, there is no room for death in theater can explain in a way the enormous way Israeli uh, society find theater so alluring, so, so attractive, you know, at least with, in the theater, there is no room for the angel of death, unlike what's uh, going on outside the theater. Um, unfortunately. So I think I'll, I'll stop here. It was, you know, a mission impossible, but I'll, I'll, I'll open it to the discussion uh, uh, right now, although I'm left with so much more material. Thank you so much, Roy. Um, you gave us a taste. I think you gave us a taste. Uh, and I must say, it was a, 
it tasted very well. <laughs> I think we all got appetite for more. And uh, the best, of course, is uh, if language permitting, if you're in Israel, go and see shows, which reminds me actually how much, well, first of all, how much I miss going to theater during the pandemic. The last play I think I was, was actually the play I went together with you in Tel Aviv at Habima, uh, which was just before the pandemic started. Um, but I think I'm ready <laughs> to go back, especially after that. And we're lucky also in Washington to have um, places like Theatre J or the Mosaic Theatre, at least until recently, where we have uh, some Israeli plays also being performed in English. Uh, I, I want to start off and then hopefully more, every, I see already a few questions, but please pose your questions into the Q&A function. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, um, you mentioned, uh, of course, a, a range of writers, uh, Hanukh Levine, you mentioned uh, Sobol, and their themes are um, sometimes universal and sometimes more, well, I don't know if particularistic is the same, is the right word, but something which is very specific to Israel and the Jewish experience. They, uh, some of them are on the Holocaust or on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict, but others, you know, they could just be written in America or Europe um, just the same way. So I'm wondering if you see a certain, what, what, if you want to comment on that. And, and of course, a, you know, a, a specific play can have a very universal, uh, universalist message as well. But if you want to comment on this, if there is this tension or not about uh, universalistic with this very particular themes about Israel. Um... I think you are very much right, but I would claim that I think every great piece of art uh, juggles between the two, between the local and the universal. You know, Moliere is French and William Shakespeare is, is English, no matter how the world, you know, embraces him and, uh, and British and, and Lorca is the Spanish. And Hanoch Levin is Jewish, Israeli, Tel Avivian, uh, South Tel Aviv, uh, very, very specific. So I think, uh, what every great artist does is in a way finding the right balance between being local and universal. Uh, you know, sometimes I, 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 I tend to tell my students that, you know, when we use the term universal, we think of it as some kind of, um, of a compliment, but, but it's not. It's, 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 it's exactly like claiming that homeless will be a compliment. Uh, uh, great artists are, are, no, are no homeless. Uh, they, they have a specific uh, uh, place and time and roots, and they are deeply rooted within a specific reality. And on the other hand, they manage to bridge the gap and to speak to uh, people elsewhere and, 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 and in other times. And I think that's, that's the constant struggle, which is not um, particular to, to Israeli writers, but um, in, in general. Uh, how do you manage to combine uh, or, or to generalize specific things into uh, universal themes that can translate uh, elsewhere? Uh, if we'll have um, a bit of time left at the end, I'll, I'll be more than happy to share with you another example, which, which was done during COVID. During COVID, you know, everybody was stuck in home and there were serious fears whether we'll ever come back to the theater. And I brought something which is uh, um, um, some kind of a physical theater piece. Not, not, it's not theater is not always about the text uh, and not all shows are uh, going, you know, from, from, stay, from page to stage. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll be more than happy to, to, to share it with you too. Uh, and I think this too plays, you know, uh, or goes the same direction between doing something very Israeli, very specific about Israeli childhood, and um, uh, on the other hand, um, um, universal, very, very universal. Well, I like, I like this answer, definitely. And maybe that will be a good end. Uh, when you show us this, but I think we okay. will have more questions. Um, I I also uh, uh, remember when you said what you said about uh, the 
the capital, of course, Jerusalem is a very special city in Israel, does not have the main theater scene in Israel, which is not surprising because we all know about the more, let's say, secular, vibrant cultural life takes place in Tel Aviv. But I do remember uh, there, there was and there still is some good theater in Jerusalem, not just in the main uh, uh, city municipal theater, but also on the, in the Khan theater. Um, sure, but but, but, in, but if you you know if if you mention the Khan, pay yeah. attention to the geography of the Khan. The Khan was given once they wanted to establish a municipal theater in Jerusalem. They gave it, you know, they put it next to the uh, rail Thanks. station outside the, the center of the city. You know, go there and do your theater right there. You know, so we you know don't ask, don't tell. We won't see. We won't. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes you know, uh, uh, looking at the at the place, the theater, uh, yeah. um, um, uh, geographically where where it, it 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 is based or located, tells us a lot about the importance that the society uh, uh, relates to it. Or, yes, uh, that's right. And you mentioned, of course, also the diversity of languages. I think for a while uh, in the 1990s, the probably most interesting. Theater was the Gesher Theater, was, was, which was then played in Russian. I remember they had like a Hebrew, actually, you could listen to the translation mm -hmm. simultaneously. Or, or, or uh, I think that was before that came after, oh. and, and it was in Russian. And, um, and I wonder how much is left of this Russian. Is there the, the, the Gesher Theater now performs in Hebrew, but is there any of the Russian? theater scene left? It, it, yeah, it, it didn't yeah, bring yeah. only a different language, but a different cul um, theater culture, I think. Is that right? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, Gesher was actually, you know, uh, another take of Habima, actually. Uh, as I mentioned before, our national theater uh, was established in Moscow in 1917. And uh, some um, uh, 70 years later, there was another take with uh, a group of students with a very charismatic uh, theater director and uh, guru of theater, which uh, um, takes them or brings them to Israel and, uh, and gives Israeli theater another uh, um, uh, lesson and actually manages to, to teach us many, many lessons and transform uh, the way we think and look at uh, theater in Israel. Um, yeah, besides Gesher, along the years, there were uh, some uh, smaller groups uh, by Russian immigrants that uh, do shows um, either in Russian uh, sololy or in or bilingual in, in, in Russian and, and Hebrew as well. One of them is, for example, is called the Malinki Theater. Malinki is small in, in Russian. And they do, they are um, an independent group which does beautiful uh, uh, productions. The, the last one, uh, you'll find the, an interest in it, is, is an adaptation of Stefan Zweig. They, they took his short story, short novel named Amok and, uh, and adapted it to the stage. And, and, and they perform, I think, in, in both uh, Russian and, and Hebrew. Yes. Um, and maybe you want to tell us a little bit about your upcoming play, which will take, which will be in Yiddish. And I think some of the actors playing in it were, are well known to the American scene from Stissel, right? Uh, no, so so you, you mixed uh, you mixed two, two stories that I told you. Uh, right now at Habima, uh, I've just directed, you mentioned it at the beginning, I, I directed a very successful, I'm happy to say, production, which is based on some of uh, Sholem Aleichem's writing. And I had the privilege of having uh, Leah Koenig, who is Israel, uh, the First Lady of Israeli Theater, and na age 92 in the lead. It's our eighth production that we do together. I've been working with her a lot in recent years, and she's in the lead. It's a wonderful story about, if I mentioned before the intensification of feminine voices, it's a story about three Jewish ladies from different generations and uh, socioeconomical uh, statuses, uh, which go with all their husbands, leave their husbands behind in Lodge and go to Zakopane, which is some kind of a vacation place in North Poland, and uh, write letters to their husbands, which are left behind, telling them, oh, you know, um, you don't miss anything that you didn't join me. Uh, I'm here alone. I'm trying to rest. And I, I only went for, you know, some health reasons. And, uh, 
while they, they cover for what they do there and what they do in Zakopane stays in Zakopane. Uh, very funny comedy. And Leah Koenig also starred in Stissel. She was the mother in Stissel and she became an international star. Both her parents were great Yiddish actors. So um, that, that's her, Leah Koenig. Uh, and the I'm next about, play? My, my next play is gonna probably be at the Yiddish Spiel. Yiddish Spiel is, is, the, is the theater which uh, plays in Yiddish in Israel. And uh, we are talking about doing um, a play based on Savion Librecht's uh, uh, story, uh, which is called, I don't know how it, um, to translate it into English, uh, The Perfect uh, Groom of Rochale or something like that. Another Holocaust uh, story which deals with the second generation basically, uh, and questions of forgiveness, memory, etc. Uh, a very uh, family drama of, of Thank the second you. generation. It, it really shows, uh, of course, it, it, it's a reflection of the variety of Israeli society and, um, and many cultures and languages. And actually it just reminds me uh, this uh, moment of uh, Theodor Herzl, who in Neuland thought that there would be, as he thought, German and French mm. and Spanish and Italian theaters in, 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 Al yeah. no, in, in old Newland in the future Jewish state. But I, I, um, I see- Our also... hope is not yet lost, you know, Michael. Our hope <laughs> is not yet lost. And I think for our students, you're, I should tell to our audience that you're teaching a class on the history on Israeli theater. For our students, it is also a different perspective um, to learn about Israeli society and history through the lens of the theater. Um, what you have now to put into 45 minutes, of course, they can learn over a whole semester. I see a few questions here. Uh, one is, uh, is there a way to access Israeli plays if you're living in the US? Uh, well, thanks to COVID, I, I must say that many theaters, you know, uh, put into the into the internet, um, uh, uploaded many productions. The question is always the the language barrier. Not not everything has uh, English subtitles, um, but some, you know, if you come to Israel, the the theaters at least once uh, a month perform each show with English uh, translation, with, with subtitles. It's, it's, it's part of their mission to, you know, to, to, to turn into tourists as well and to perform or to at least to supply uh, translations. Um, but, but I think um, on, on the internet, you can uh, find uh, texts are easily, uh, are, are much easier to, to locate than, than full productions. Uh, there is one of the hats that I wear is I'm the artistic director of what we call the International Exposure of Israeli Theater, which is a festival that brings every year theater directors and festival directors from all over the world and try to uh, to expose them to what we have to offer. And, and all the plays are translated into mainly to English, but to other languages as well. And there is a special uh, site uh, if you Google International Exposure of Israeli Theater, you'll come uh, to our site and there you can find uh, many, many texts, uh, many, many plays. Um, so th this can serve as a, as a source. Yes. Uh, and uh, well, there's a question about signing up to your class on Zoom, but it's not on Zoom, it is in person. And I'm afraid this won't be possible, but I think um, for all of those who are listening, I do hope that we will have uh, Roy Horowitz back and perhaps in person, um, maybe even with some students for another event uh, before the semester ends. That's our, our hope. Um, I also have a comment here from uh, Jerome Chains, who is himself a writer about theater. And he writes on Chanoch Levin's uh, Krum. Krum in Yiddish is crooked uh, or bent. And the irony in his reading is that everybody in the play is Krum, is crooked, mm -hmm. uh, besides, of course, um, uh, the title role character who is straightforward. I don't know if you want to comment on that. 
Mm. Yeah, he's, he's right. Uh, you know, names within Hanoch Levin plays is, is, is something which calls for a separate seminar. We can speak about it uh, for hours. Uh, but yes, he's very much uh, rooted and uses um, the Yiddish and, 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 and uh, um, Eastern uh, European languages in order to uh, uh, characterize his, 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 uh, uh, his characters. It's, it's, it's right. And it has meanings in Yiddish, sometimes in Polish, sometimes uh, he has a, um, a, a character named Koklusz, which is uh, coughing in Polish. He's, he's such a, he, he's, he's, he's sick, he's the hypochondria. He, he uses many, sometimes the name uh, tells you, you know, who, who, who the person is. Yeah, it's, it's a device he, he, he uses uh, a lot. Yeah, so maybe uh, Roy, at, uh, as, we, as we are coming towards the end, do you want to show us that example? You, uh, I, I, it's because you said you were longing to go back to the theater. This is a, um, a short, uh, but it will take seven minutes. I hope you, you bear with me, but uh, uh, it's a short um, um, physical theater, uh, which is called, uh, uh, I think, Comfort Object in in uh, English, and yes, let's see it. I think it deals with with our uh, shared longing to going back to the theater. See what uh, they did. Uh, just a minute. What? Just a minute. ברוכות וברוכים הבאים לעבודה חפץ מעבר. נא לעמוד במקומות המסומנים באדום. ב-1951 טבע הפסיכואנליטיקאי דונלד ויניקוט את המונח אובייקט מעבר. חפץ, המאפשר לתינוק תחושת ביטחון בתהליך ההיפרדות מההורה. החפץ הוא לרוב רך ונעים, ומייצג עבור התינוק חום והרגעה. באנגלית הוא נקרא גם comfort object, חפץ נחמה. חפץ המעבר נמצא באזור הדמדומים שבין הממשי למדומיין. אזור זה מכונה על ידי ויניקוט, מרחב פוטנציאלי. ברוכים הבאים למרחב הפוטנציאלי שלכם. הדובי שלפניכם מלא בחומר מילוי רך ואיכותי מסוג פוליאסטר משולב כותנה סוג א'. הוא מצופה בפרווה מלאכותית הולנדית מסוג שוורצפיץ. יש לו אישור תקן ממעבדות SGS ו-CTI הבינלאומיות. הוא בעל גזרה שמנה ורגליים בפרופורציה הנכונה. יש לו חיוך גדול ומודגש. יש לו כפות רגליים עם אצבעות מודפסות עליהם. והוא כבד. הוא כאן בשבילכם. מידותיו מותאמות לחיבוק עם אדם בוגר. הדובי הזה נולד בסין במפעל טדי צ'אן בפאתי העיר ווהאן, לאחר שלושה חודשים בהם המפעל היה סגור. כל עובדי המפעל נמצאו שליליים לנגיף הקורונה. הוא עבר דרך ארוכה כדי להגיע אליכם, ועכשיו אתם כאן, איתו. התבוננו בפניו. הן מספרות סיפור. התבוננו בגופו. איך זה ירגיש לגעת בו? זה הזמן לתת לו שם. אמרו אותו לעצמכם בלב. נעים להכיר. אם אתם רוצים לגעת בדובי, התקדמו לסימון הבא שלפניכם. היה לכם חפץ מעבר כשהייתם קטנים?
אתם זוכרים ממה הוא היה עשוי? את הגודל? זה היה דובי או סמיכי? או אולי משהו אחר? איך קראתם לו? עולה. כשאנחנו נולדים, החוש הראשון שזמין לנו הוא חוש המישוש. ואנחנו זקוקים למגע בשביל לשרוד. אם אני לא רואה טוב, ארכיב משקפיים. אם אני לא שומעת טוב, אלך לבדיקה. אבל מה קורה אם יש לנו בעיה במגע? אפשר לבוא לרופא ולהגיד לו, דוקטור, כואב לי הגרון. אבל אי אפשר לבוא ולהגיד לו, דוקטור, לא נגעו בי שלושה חודשים. אתה חושב שזה פוגע לי במערכת החיסונית? האדם הממוצע זקוק לארבעה חיבוקים ביום. הדובי הזה נוצר רק כדי לחבק. מידותיו מותאמות לחיבוק עם אדם בוגר. תרצו למעוך אותו? להעביר עליו יד? אולי למשש אותו? להניח עליו ראש? אולי לתת לו בוקס? נסתכלו עליו. מה הוא רוצה להגיד לכם? אם תרצו להתקרב אליו, התקדמו לסימון הבא שלפניכם. איפה אתם אוהבים שנוגעים בכם? הדובי הזה כאן בשבילכם. מה תרצו לעשות איתו? זו ההזדמנות שלכם. כשתתחיל המוזיקה, אתם מוזמנים לגשת אליו. הזמן שלכם במרחב הפוטנציאלי עומד להיגמר. לעתים, הפרידה מחפץ המעבר אינה קלה. לעתים, איננו בשלים לכך עדיין, אך בכל זאת מגיעה העת להיפרד. אם הזזתם את הדובי, אנא החזירו אותו למקומו. הביטו בו עוד פעם אחרונה, ודי. וכשתרגישו מוכנים, צאו מהחדר מהדלת שמימינכם. תודה שהשתתפתם בעבודה חפץ מעבר. Thank you. I bought a timely and universalistic <laughs> piece at the end. Um, I would um, before we go, I would also like to uh, remind our audience that we we are starting another series soon on he on Israeli writers and on March 15th, 
uh, Israeli writer David Grossman, I'm sure known to most of you, um, will kick it off. Uh, we will have a converse, conversation about his latest book on March 15th. And um, we do hope to have uh, you back, Roy, maybe in person for another event before you return to Israel after the end of the semester. And um, for now, I think your students can enjoy you uh, every week, which is uh, wonderful and get more than just a small taste of Israeli theater. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you all for joining us. <laughs>